this episode, we're at Kako O'ivi, a nonprofit lo'i in Kaneohe that is working to restore the wetland for food production, cultural revival, and water quality improvement. We talk to farmers and researchers from Kako O'ivi, the Water Resources Research Center, and the University of Hawaii Economic Research Organization. First, we meet with Nick Rapun, the farm manager of Kako O'ivi. We are in the Aupua of Heia in Kolaupoko district on Oahu. Specifically, we're at Kako Oivi. We've got a 406 acre lease from the state. Historically, I mean, this is a, this is a wetland basin. In traditional Hawaiian times, this would have been one of the first areas where they started farming open flat land, access to water. As we move forward closer to modern history, we've got some actual photographic evidence of this entire basin being cultivated. And the photos that we have are from the 1920s. What is clear in that image is that there was flow through and clear water channels that connected the Makai side, the ocean water, to the upper part of the stream where the stream enters into the wetland. So there's a full connectivity and flow of water all the way through. The reason why that is super important is for all of our native fish species that utilize both fresh water and salt water and then the brackish habitat. When we look at the landscape now, we've got 90 some percent invasive species. We've got a 15 plus acre mangrove forest that has established in the mouth of the river. And what that's done is built up sediment over time, impeded the flow of water. Our neighbors down the way here, the fish pond, uh, Heia Fish Pond, it's one of the largest fish ponds on Oahu. Those ponds utilize that near shore ecosystem, that little estuary to basically breed the fish. And then even in the wetland itself is dominated by invasive grasses. We've seen as we open up more and more, our water quality is improved. We're trying to create connectivity from where the stream enters into the wetland to the bottom by de developing out our um, water management systems for the taro patches. And then we're also seeing um, out in the wetland as we build out more patches, we're creating these open mud flats, which are prime for growing taro, but the birds also really love that habitat too. So we've seen recruitment of birds come in, of our native birds, Aoku'u, Ai'o, Alai'ula, they come, they come around. The more we build out patches, the more we see those birds moving back into our space here, and, or their space rather. So that's, that's pretty cool as well to see. And we've had, with the Ai'o, we've had almost every year a successful nesting. We've had one pair that comes and nests every season and they raise their babies here and then they go fly off. We, as much as possible, try to make this a working farm. It is education focused, but we do sell our product as well as a way to get some earned revenue so that we can run our programs. We're selling to restaurants as well as direct to customers. We have maybe a 10 month crop cycle from start to finish when we prep the field plant it, you know, do all the maintenance, and then by the time we start harvesting, it usually takes us about a month to harvest each patch. When we're done harvesting, we let the field rest or fallow it, and I try and have them fallow at least for four months. Oh, wow. And that's to allow any crop residue, um, small taro that we didn't harvest or stuff that went bad, weeds, anything else that was in the patch at the end of the harvest, all gets kind of smashed into the mud again, and then that stuff needs time to break down so that we can basically allow the patch to kind of clean itself. If there's no taro growing in there, it cleans out any disease that might be in there, and then we get a fresh start again. Here, we're looking at one of our patches that we're harvesting right now. We have to do what the land allows us to do. And one of the things that we've discovered here is that we have to use this style. We've got basically a raised bed or a mound in the patch. The water quality is not sufficient to grow in what most people see for, for lo'i right now, which is, you know, that kind of rice paddy look, flat, flooded, open field. There's not enough oxygen in the water. One of the reasons there's not enough oxygen is because of 
all of the invasive grasses in the wetland. So you've got oxygen rich water coming in from the stream and it hits the wetland, uh, sheets out and disperses the grass, sucks all the oxygen out of it. And by the time it gets down to our lo'i here, there's not enough oxygen for the taro. So when you bring the mud up out of the water, basically allows oxygen to penetrate into the soil profile, and then the plant roots can get that oxygen. But right now we're harvesting this patch. I'll just pull out one of these plants so you can check it out. Pull it out, mud and all. This is uh, what we would call the makua, or the parent plant. These are the true roots. The corm, the part that most people eat, is not actually a root, it's a modified stem. And you've got your corm, or your modified stem, and then you have your petioles and leaves. And you can see there's a few spots here where some of these babies, or the oha, were attached. And these basically will come right off the side, like this. So we put in the parent plant, which goes in as a cutting, and then uh, it starts producing babies after a while. And so then this is what we would replant. We would cut the bottom off, take the leaves off, and then this is what gets replanted. This is the huli. You would poke that into a nice fresh mound, bury it, and that would go. As far as this goes, we just clean, get it ready to eat. Clean all the roots off here. That's what you would steam and then eat. I mean, you can eat the entire plant. All of this is edible. You know, you make your lao laos or your luau stew with that. One of our other staff is actually a excellent chef and he's made dishes out of the roots too. No so you can eat everything. It's pretty <laughs> awesome. Taro is grown all over the South Pacific, all over Asia. So it's a very international plant actually. There's records of it being grown in Egypt, in Greece, um, stuff like that. So it's, it's pretty wild how far it's gone around. Um, this, this variety that we're growing here, this one with the red veins on the leaves, this is actually a um, Palawan variety. Could be a hybrid variety with Hawaiians, Hawaiian varieties and Palawan varieties. We're not exactly sure. I've been given a lot of different names for this one, but this is one of the main ones that we grow for production because it's fairly leaf uh, resistant to leaf blight, and then it also does well in these kind of swampy, anoxic, uh, or, or environments without much oxygen in them. So it does it does good for us here. It yields well. We do have a collection of Hawaiian varieties that we like to keep. That's more on the in our dry land area. And we've got maybe about 17 or 20 Hawaiian varieties on hand of, of varying amounts. The University of Hawaii Sea Grant College program focused on Hawaii's coasts and its communities through sustainable development, safe seafood supply, sustainable coastal tourism, hazard resilience, and healthy coastal ecosystems. Hawaii's Sea Grant. Welcome back. We're talking with Dr. Kim Falinski from the Nature Conservancy of Hawaii, who is studying changes in water quality at Kako Oivi. It really isn't known how, like, there's a lot of cultural understanding of how having lo'i can influence your environment. There's the, the kind of that understanding, but from a scientific understanding, understanding how much sediment can build up in those lo'i, how much the water can be cleaned through that system, how the bay can respond, because Kaneohe Bay and the fish pond are right down, downstream, how the nutrients, right? So we have a whole suburban development right above us, how the nutrient profiles will change as it moves through all this beautiful farm. 
We've observed that as we add individual lo'i in, that when storm systems come through, like Tropical Storm Darby, or this year we've had a number of storm pulses come through, that the lo'i are really resilient. That of all the things, everything else gets fully knocked down. The water level would come probably to my um, na'al here, to my right here. The water comes all the way up and over this whole system, but that the kalo can continue to grow through that, which is amazing, and that there's a sediment build up so all this the dirty water that's coming downstream we end up seeing a couple centimeters of just like a sheen across the entire system meaning that during those big storm events we can slow the water down and hold back the sediment it's important because the coral reef that's just downstream of us is one of the nicest reefs in Hawaii. And to have it smothered with all of that sediment and to have freshwater pulses, these are natural events, but if you have too much sediment coming from upstream, it'll be harder for those corals to grow. So as a natural wetland, this place is really special because there aren't big wetlands like this in Hawaii in that many places, and certainly nowhere left that is this natural. And to have 200 acres of open wetland is really special. All these little stream channels all have individual names. All the water features have names in Hawaiians. So this is the Awai and it feeds downstream and there's a Makawai that brings it back and we build a Manawai down there to build the dam and to re-engineer the... So all that Hawaiian engineer, water engineering is like the lifeblood of this project. So. How neat that you get to bridge that cultural knowledge with their scientific tools. Yeah, I think so. I studied as an engineer for all the first half of my career, and so to be able to be that engineer scientist, both moving the water around and building roads and bridges and also measuring the effects is pretty neat. You have a sedge back here, that umbrella sedge, and Job's tears, and Californian grass, and all of those grasses. There's about 50 acres of wetland on this side where this tributary is coming down to feed the stream and they're sucking up all the nitrate that's in the water. So right here, we have very, very little nitrate in the water. Um, whereas on the other side, where the stream just goes straight, right, without moving through a lot of wetland, you have much higher ammonia and nitrate levels before it moves through this system. This is really doing its job, but it isn't feeding people. And so the idea would be to make sure that we continue kind of serving these functions, but feeding people and allowing all the birds to be able to live in the same system. Because you can't live in here. There's nothing that can live in there. I can't even walk through there 10 feet to get over there, right? If you can see that PVC sticking up with the little tape on it all the way to the tippy top over there, I have long-term plots in there so I can figure out how much sediment is building up in those plots. But man, just to get right there or that one right there like takes forever because it's hard to get through this grass. So if I can't, the birds can't. Nothing can except for pigs. So we'd like to be able to open it up so everybody can live in the environment and we continue to clean the water. Next, we're moving beyond the physical aspects of the lo'i with graduate student Casey Ching, who is studying the social effects of restoring kako'o iwi through their innovative ohana adoption program. My work essentially was great because I basically just did participatory research where I got to develop these intimate relationships with these families and, and have these very close conversations with them in a space that provided us the ability to do this. And kind of just see what exactly they gained from that. They have a lot of these like mindsets where they would come out here and be very well intentioned because when you're trying to grow your own food, you're trying to have really good vibes about it, right? Because it's going into your bodies later. So it was just a really safe space for them to come out here. And a lot of them kind of talked about it as their sanctuary. Can you talk to me from a research perspective? What are the, the tools or processes that you go through to take that experience with the Ohanas and turn it into a, a research product like with numbers or things that you can present? When Kako Evie actually kind of approached me about do, answering this question for them, one thing that I discovered among a lot of literature that I looked up was that it didn't really fit into what the families were telling me. Sometimes, you know, we assign Western words to things that are not Western, especially when you're doing a practice like this. So I actually used a Hawaii-based ecosystem service framework, which took into account Hawaiian values, such as pilina kanaka, connecting with socially ike, or Hawaiian knowledge. And I used that to categorize the benefits that I learned the families were gaining from being out here. And they felt that that framework was a lot more, or resonated a lot more with them than 
typically Western words such as supporting services and food production, things like that. I essentially just kind of came out here and met with all the families and then one-on-one -on -one contacted all of them to try to set up these one-on-one -on -one interviews and we essentially just come out here and weed or harvest or whatever they needed help with and talk while we did that and then I would record all of that, transcribe it, and then try to tease out like these really valuable quotes that I got from them and then fit them into this framework and what I felt like it represented in different categories of Hawaii ecosystem service or cultural ecosystem services or what I like to call them. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely think that by using a Hawaii-based ecosystem framework that was developed within a Hawaiian community by a Hawaiian researcher, it fit this community of Ohana much more than other frameworks that I looked into that were more so developed um, through different types of research that were not Hawaii based. We are looking for a few heroes, mentors, trailblazers, innovators, a passion to change lives spark curiosity, open hearts, and awaken minds. Help students answer the question, who am I? This could be your calling, but this is no job. It's the journey of a lifetime. Be a hero. Be a teacher. Welcome back. We're talking with Dr. Kim Burnett, about the bottom line economic future of Lo'i restoration and how work at Kakoo Iwi might translate to similar efforts in other locations. My role in this project is really looking at kind of financial um, sustainability of Kakoo Iwi over time. So one of their main goals is to bring back the kalo and part of that is making sure there's a market to sell it. Aside from looking at kind of the profitability of kalo, we wanted to consider the other crops that may be able to be sold. Working with Nick Rapoon, who's a farm manager, we identified both breadfruit or ulu and bananas as, as possible potential crops. So we looked at those markets and the margins over 20 years and actually there's a really great opportunity for Kako Weavey to be financially sustainable in the future. What we did was we looked at kind of the, the past data on how much kalo is sold for, how much bananas sell for, how much ulu is sold for, and then also the cost of, of maintaining and harvesting them. We used data from markets studies before and kind of thought about the future and how much could be sold. And the nice thing about breadfruit and banana is, as you can see, it's, it's already here and it has a lot of potential to be grown kind of on the outskirts and along the roads. And it doesn't require the kind of, you know, very arduous work and labor as the Kalo. And so it's it's able to support the program while we're doing the restoration in Kako Weavey. You have to go and ask, how long does it take to grow? Um, how many trees can we plant per acre? Because all of those things are gonna factor into the calculations and working with like Kim Falinski, who looks at the sediment and nutrients and how the fertilizer changes those things, that all factors into the economics of how much can be grown and sold and the cost of doing those things. The other thing that they want to do is, is put in a poi mill eventually, and that's really going to help, especially if they bring in, they're thinking about bringing in solar PV to power the poi mill, then it's actually going to be more self-sustainable, more self-sufficient, and they'll actually be able to s save money and also sell electricity back to the grid. And that all helps the sustainability financially of the program. It's been great to work with them and partner with them to kind of show that this is like a whole big picture of benefits. It's not just cultural, it's not just ecological or environmental, it's also economic. In the long term, you see more profitability because the more families that come in, the more cost savings you have. And that is a very unique model that I haven't seen done in Hawaii or really anywhere. And so they really have this great idea that hopefully can be replicable in other places. How is their plan for maintaining the involvement of those ohana over time? You know, I think there's a big demand to, to get in and do it. There's a lot of people that, I mean, we know that, you know, they sell out of poi every weekend. You know, they, they have a hard time keeping it on the shelf. So the demand is higher right now than the supply. There's so many other benefits of working the Lo'i and being a part of this program. 
Next, we're talking with Dr. Leah Bremer about putting together a team to help Kako Oivi plan for its future. What are the potential benefits of lo'i restoration at scale? So they really have this goal of restoring lo'i throughout the historical range, which is I think about 200 acres. Um, and they wanted us to help them think about what are the actual like, ecological, cultural, social, and economic benefits of that over time. I pulled together an interdisciplinary team of economists, of um, some social scientists, um, and Kim Falinski, who's a water quality scientist, to look at those different impacts. So we developed some scenarios over time and looked at what would be the benefits in terms of sediment and nutrient retention, which is important at the Ahupua'a or watershed scale, in terms of links to Pai Pai Ohe'ia, the nonprofit downstream. And then we looked at cultural values and outcomes, and we worked with Casey, who did interviews with some of the farmers who are participating in the Ohana program, which provides opportunities for local families to farm patches of, of Kahlo. And then we have a team of economists looking at crop yield over time and some of the, the cost and benefits over time. But we also have in the works an agroforestry restoration project. So we got some funding to do restoration of food forests in the upland areas. So it'll be kind of a similar approach of how do you restore watersheds for multiple benefits? So thinking about cultural benefits and socioeconomic benefits as well as ecological benefits. What has been your favorite part of this research project? Uh, my favorite part is getting to come out and connect with the staff at, at Kako EV and, and work on research that's connected to community. Have you found anything that surprised you? Yeah, so I mean, one of the most interesting things I think that came out of the work was how important the family or the ohana program is, a program where families come and work in the, work in the lo'i and take care of a lo'i with their family, and seeing how important that program is in terms of their, their social and cultural benefits, but also it's really part of their model of, of being able to scale in a financially sustainable way. And is that kind of opportunity to be on the ground with the organization, with the community partners, a rare or unique in academic research? Yeah, I mean, in some cases it is, but there's more and more of emphasis on doing research that matters, which in, you know means that you need to engage with, with communities and really understand what are the, the questions that people want answered. I mean, I'm not, from my position, that's really the, the crux of my position is doing work that meets community needs and meets community questions and is, is co-designed with, with community groups and, and, and nonprofits. I um, mean, I think throughout, you know, academics the, traditionally has been very disconnected from um, real community questions, but I think in Hawaii in, in particular there's a real emphasis on trying to really align um, the work that's done in academics with, with real needs. Is that also a component of the Water Resources Research Center? Yeah, so WRC and also UHERO, UH Economic Research Organization, which I'm a part of, both of those um, organizations, the central goal is to do research that meets community needs and interest and, and to really engage and co-design research and, and, and approaches. Paco EV is just a really wonderful community-based nonprofit to work with. And so as a research team, we're just really grateful for them for spending time with us in the field and really helping to connect the different pieces of, of research together. Although the LOE is still small compared to its long-term goals, by working together with WRRC and New Hero, Kako Oivi has formed a modern model of business, ecosystem, and cultural restoration that will hopefully inspire similar efforts in Hawaii and across the Pacific. Mahalo for watching Voice of the Sea. University of Hawaii Sea Grant College Program. Helping coastal communities of Hawaii and the Pacific. Through research, education, and outreach. Serving the community, from elementary to graduate students. Hawaii Sea Grant.